Good afternoon, Johannesburg. Good afternoon, Johannesburg. I've got to excite you because I'm going to talk about mathematics now. And anybody who's mathematically challenged, it's probably this is the time to leave. Now, I've always been good at maths. In fact, I think I've been quite good, very good. But almost everybody I meet has been mathematically challenged. Nowadays, you ask kids, and I've asked many people today, yesterday, what was your worst subject at school? And they say, well, mathematics. The kids of today are struggling. And I want to find out what happens in the brain. And I want to do this by means of brain surgery. And I've called it brain surgery on young mathematical minds. I was going to bring a little kid here, take off their brain and show you how it works, but they said there might be some ethical issues in doing that. So, I want to tell you firstly about the state of mathematics in South Africa. By every international study that's been conducted in the last 20 years on the state of mathematics in the world, South Africa has come last or at best third last in every country of the world. And yet, South Africa spends more money on education than any of the other countries. So something has gone wrong here. I believe part of the reason is how we understand the mathematical mind of the child. Firstly, we take the brain, and when we break it down, we find out that we've all got 100 billion neurons in our brain. 100 billion is a big number. Now, some of you might have plus or minus 20, more than that, but 100 billion is what we've got. Somewhere inside there is our knowledge of mathematics. Now, I want to find out where that is so that if people struggle with maths, I want to be able to fix it. So, what is mathematics? What does it tell us? And is it relevant? Does maths count in this world? How many people have told me, at the end of school, I never use my maths again? So I want to see if I can just entice you to look at a few examples of why maths is relevant before I get into the real body of what I'm doing. So let's have a look at this. Now you look at this and it looks, wow, what a wonderful pattern. It's kind of regular, it's kind of irregular. And what is it? It's actually a building, a building I photographed near the O2 Arena in London. And I thought, that is a fantastic geometry. And that is mathematics as we find our way into architecture. Let's have a look at another project taking place. Some of you have probably heard of the Square Kilometre Array, a big radio astronomy project taking place in the Northern Cape in Carnarvon. This is going to be the world's biggest scientific project. It's going to generate more data than has ever been generated on this planet. In fact, there's so much data that the challenge is now where to put that data and how to process it. But one thing we do know, mathematicians are needed to do this. That project comes online in 15 years' time. We've got to start preparing those mathematicians now. Now, I'd like to ask, you know, who likes maths and who doesn't like maths, and who's made good out of being a mathematician? I want to show you a picture of some people. You'll probably recognize some of these people. Bill Gates is very well known, uh, some of the others, Elon Musk. All of these are mathematicians. Those top five have drastically change the way our world thinks. They all happen to be among the richest people in the world as well. So does maths count? Let's think again. Alan Turing at the bottom, which I'm sure nobody's ever heard of. Who's Alan Turing? What did Alan Turing do? He happened to be voted the best British scientist of the 20th century. What did he invent? He invented the computer. He invented computer programming. He invented artificial intelligence. Was he great? He was possibly one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. And he's given us the world we live in today. Every one of us on this planet, well, let's say those who have got the technology, use his product. And by a few years' time, everybody will use his product. But there was a time where every one of these started off life, and they began to see maths, and they began to develop a love of maths. So how young do we have to be to start developing that? Well. It's family photo time. This is my granddaughter. She's holding an iPhone. If you look at her concentration in her hand and the way she's holding it, what you'll notice, she's doing something. 
When I looked at her, I thought, oh, isn't that sweet? She's playing with her mother's phone. But in fact, she was playing a game. Now, she's not even two years old yet and can't even verbalize enough words to make a sentence. The other day she came, she came and sat next to me. And she was playing a game, then she stopped it, swiped a little bit, picked out a video and showed me a little video of herself. Then within a couple more minutes, back to the game and she'd forgotten about her granddad altogether. But she's got a love of something and kids like doing things they love. So what happened to maths? Well, if we look at the various grades that we go through, from grade R up to grade 12, Everybody I've met says there was a point in time where they loved maths, and then something happened. And by the end of school, they didn't like maths very much anymore. And especially in the grade seven to nine period, which was absolutely critical, because at the end of grade nine, they have to make a very big decision, is it pure maths or maths literacy? And maths literacy is a bit of a problem even though it's supposed to be easier and schools might push you into that, it denies access to the STEM subjects, science, technology, and education, and of course, mathematics. If you've denied that, by the time you get to the end of grade 12, you cannot get into the university to study the, what I consider to be the really nice, juicy, interesting subjects. So what happens in these grades? And I want to give you an example of a problem that occurs in these grades. Here is a nice problem, a grade nine problem. And even those of you who are mathematically literate might look at this and think, that's quite a difficult problem. And I want to point you to the very first part, two to the power of 2015. That is a very, very large number. If we write out that number, I could say, that is more than the atoms in this universe and in every other parallel universe we can conceive of. That's how big that number is. And there's three of them. That one plus another one plus another one, divided by another number, the same thing. But what is strange is that that only gives us three points. Out of 100 points in examination, we only get three points for this. Some grade nine learners will look at that and figure it out immediately, and they could give you the answer. And the answer to that, if anybody has figured it out already, is 42, which so some of you might know is the answer to the riddle of life, the universe, and everything. Okay. But that's another story for another day. So what happens in grades seven to nine? I'm going to give you two examples of the type of maths that are studied, the common fractions and the decimal fractions. Common fractions, seven over eight. Now, I remember I was teaching about 15 years ago, a young rural girl teaching on maths. You know, I've been tutoring maths for close on 45 years now. Never really been a formal maths teacher, but I've always enjoyed and loved passing on my knowledge. And I asked this, this rural girl, OK, take a pizza, cut it into eight pieces, and eat seven of them. And what is the fraction that represents um, those seven pieces of that pizza? And she says, sir, I have to ask a question. I say, certainly, that's what I'm here for. I'm the teacher. She says, sir, what is a pizza? <laughs> Our knowledge of maths is not just the numbers, but how those n numbers relate to the real world. Let's look at 0 0.45. 0 0.45, we might see this in a supermarket, a, a measure of something. We might take out a tape measure and measure a table. It's 0 0.45 meters. These two number systems collectively have taken at least 1,000 years of human development to get to the point which we're using them right now. That's a long time. In fact, the common fractions we can take back to the days of the Egyptians, 3,000 3, years ago. And that's how long it took to get to where we are right now. But yet in grades seven to nine, in total, 40 hours is dedicated to these two topics. 40 hours is one week or five days of eight hours each, which is less than two days per year for these two very important number systems. And we wonder why they come out of grade nine not knowing these two fundamental number systems. I'm going to do something that no other speaker has done. I'm going to get you to do something now. OK? Are you ready? Yeah. Are you all awake? I know this is mathematics, but are you awake? Yeah. I've got a problem for you. I want you to look at it, and I'm going to ask a question. Which of these is the smallest number? Have a little look at it. So how many people think the first one is the smallest number? Okay, how many, no, 
hands, hands right up so I can see them. Oh, good. How many people think the second number is the smallest one? Okay. So we've got quite a few. In fact, about a third of the audience picked those two. In fact, the correct one is the bottom one. Now, I'm not interested whether you got it right or wrong. I want to know what went on in your brain while you tried to solve that problem. Okay? So, firstly, did you find that too easy or too difficult or just right? Because if it was too easy for you, I'm wasting your time. Same if it was too difficult. If you say, oh, I did last did that at school, I haven't got a clue where to start. But if it's just right, it falls into the Goldilocks zone. Now, some of you might remember Goldilocks, and for those who don't, I put a picture up for you. Goldilocks went to visit the three bears, and she had a bowl of porridge. One was too hot, one was too cold, and one was just right. So whenever we've got a problem that fits into too much, too little, or just right, we tend to call them Goldilocks problems. This is a Goldilocks problem in mathematics. And it's just right. If it's just right for you, it means it's your perfect level of learning at this point of what you need to know right now. Okay. So, what's going on in the brain? Now, schemas. Now, you might have wondered what this is for. Maybe I'm going to juggle them or something. What it actually looks like, it actually looks like these, these little things here, these round things. And, you know, it's... Um... Now, every one of these represents a little mathematical object. So what I'm going to do is give you a problem. The yellow one represents minus n. The blue one represents that the sum that minus n times minus n equals plus n. That one happens to be correct. The red one happens to be minus n times minus n is minus n, which is wrong, but it is a very common misconception among learners. So let's give you a question. Minus 6 minus minus 7. Ah, minus 6, I take out the yellow one. Minus minus 7, well, I've got a choice of red or blue. Which one am I going to use? If I use the blue one, I get the right answer. And the teacher says, well done. And now, that blue one is very important to me. It's part of my vocabulary of mathematics. If I use the red one, it's wrong. And if the teacher gives me the good feedback and says that's wrong, I've got to get rid of the red one and replace it with the blue one. That's learning. So how do we get rid of it? Well, I must tell you, don't try this at home with your kids. Okay. <laughs> it's actually not quite correct. Effectively, you inject this one in and you inject that one out. Now, theoretically, that's what's happened, but of course, this is a metaphor. This isn't, this isn't real, and I hope you all understand that. <laughs> so, I want to now go through what is the role of the teacher, of the perfect teacher, and the perfect learner. The perfect teacher needs to know what is that child's Goldilocks zone. What are the, what is the, where are they right now in their thinking? They need to then pose just that right question, and when they get the response, pose just the right feedback. The key thing is the teacher is not allowed to make mistakes. And one of the challenges of the current educational system in this country, there aren't enough maths teachers who can do this. That is the big challenge. We just don't have enough and we can't produce them fast enough. In fact, anybody who is good at maths is not a maths teacher. This is a big challenge. What is important is that those three elements can be automated. And I'm going to come on to that just now. What is the learner's job? Answer the questions, receive the feedback. When they get the feedback, the natural learning takes place. How learning works. Learning is an adaptation to the outside world. When we see the outside world, we adapt our thinking, and that is what learning is. We don't have to learn how to learn. It's built into us. It's part of our survival mechanism. We could call it survival of the species that can adapt the most. How do we adapt? We adapt in adjusting our brain. We change one ball for another ball, and that's what happens. So, now to my final question. What am I doing? Why am I here? What have I come to tell you? I believe that artificial intelligence and robotics can automate those three processes of the teacher and can become a perfect maths teacher. This is where my focus is. That is what I'm doing. And in conjunction with that, I'm also building something called the Museum of Mathematics to, to become a, a sustainable repository of mathematical knowledge. And as my friend Agent Smith from The Matrix says, never send a human to do a machine's job. But I want to keep this thought in mind. I've got one more slide for you.
Because as I wrote this, I realized there's a better question. When, not if, when, will an artificial intelligence become a better maths teacher than all of the human teachers? And like the best chess program in the world, which happens to be better than any chess master, will our maths teacher be a computer program? Thank you.